we left off with the Han Dynasty. The Han fell after, you know, your normal, typical dynastic cycle of wars, rebellions. There's a famine that kills like 9 million people, which leads to hungry, angry peasants toppling a government. But what makes this cycle of dynasty different than other or previous cycles was that Buddhism had made its way into China along the Silk Roads prior to the end of the Han Dynasty, right near the end. So Buddhism is going to be that thing that helps people cope with the chaotic time before the next dynasty rises. So the Silk Roads, as you can see from the map, it's more like a system of interconnected trade routes, not one single road. But the big thing for you to remember is that this is probably the classical era and post-classical era's largest trade route. Um, in the known world and if anybody who's anybody who's going to make money is going to be involved in this some way or another. So I've tried to kind of type in some of the things that I would normally go back and clarify in class because I'm not there to see your faces and the confusion to repeat things. So please feel free to pause and add things in as you need or go back. If you've got questions feel free to message me on Canvas and I will respond or clarify when I see you guys on Tuesday. So what was the Silk Road? Silk Road is really more of a highway system than a single road. If you think about it, you don't go from New York to LA on the same interstate the whole way. You have to keep switching roads, but it is still one connected system of roads, and that's how the Silk Roads worked. It is going to be that main highway system between east and west. It is going to start at China's kind of east coast, and travel up through the deserts over the Himalayan mountains across um, India and all the way to the Mediterranean Sea. So this is going to be kind of the main artery of cultural interaction. Why is the Silk Road so important? Because this is how goods, ideas, and diseases all spread. All trade routes spread these three things. But the biggest things that it's going to spread are those ideas and the diseases. Buddhism is going to spread along the trade routes into China where when most people say Buddhism today they don't think of Buddhism's origins, they think of China. And diseases. You know people carry diseases, people carry flu, that's why the flu and things like that always seem to spread over the holidays because people travel from one area to another. And the three big things that are going to travel along the Silk Road trade route are going to be the plague, smallpox, and influenza. So the Silk Road gets its start because of the Chinese explorer Zheng Xiyan. Um, he's going to take a trip. He's going to be put in charge of an expedition that is going to go westward and try and gain allies to deal with these nomadic invaders. So he's going to, he's going to be sent on kind of a peace mission. The result, though, is he's going to get kidnapped and enslaved. And through the process of his enslavement, he's going to make his way to the coast there near Syria. And he's going to see all kinds of amazing things in the world, eventually is going to gain his freedom. But anyway, he goes back, reports back to the emperor a few years later, and he gets sent on a second trip, this time to establish trade agreements to get access to those, some of those amazing goods. So while he's there, he gets uh, discovers and kind of finds access to this Roman glass and these Indian spices, and he really works on setting up those trade routes. So what's the big deal about silk? Silk fibers and cloth. We talked about this a little bit in class, but about how only the Chinese knew how to make it at that quality. Other people knew how to make silk, but they can't get that quality. And it is the one thing everybody wants. Because you have to keep in mind, other people are wearing animal hair. And if you've ever worn a wool shirt without something underneath it, it's itchy, it shrinks, it's just not very friendly. Silk is very comfortable to wear. It's warm when it's cold out, it's cool against your skin when it's hot out. It's just a really nice, durable material that's also very comfortable. But the production of silk is a state secret, and anybody who goes to share it, it becomes a death penalty. What China can't seem to figure out is how to make glass, and Rome knows how to do that well. So this creates a really good trade scenario where one side's got one thing that, you know, one side covets, and then the other side covets the other thing. So they do business well. So the eastern half of the Silk Road, the part that's in China, has multiple routes. You have to think about it like a relay race. You pass the baton. So one person does not travel the entire Silk Road. They may start in China and get halfway and then sell silk for something else and then they carry the silk a little bit farther and then eventually you know somebody's going to carry it across the desert probably in a caravan with camels and then when they get to the Himalayan mountains, those camels are not going to be very helpful for the mountains. So eventually there's one part, it's called the Trail of Bones, because you have to go on foot 
So goods that are lightweight but high demand are going to be the things that are traveled along the Silk Roads at the beginning. Think small quantities but high value. Silk is great because it doesn't weigh a whole lot. As long as you can fit it in a bag, you can pretty much carry it. Spices, seeds, those are all really good things to carry. So from China, silk is certainly the most important good, but cast iron, paper, and various seeds from China, and we'll go into detail with that in the next slide. Um, from Central Asia, as they pass over the Himalayan mountains and they're passing through Central Asia, they're going to pick up furs from the northern, the Kiev Rus, who eventually are going to be the Russians. Um, precious metals like gold and silver, and various gems like rubies and sapphires and emeralds, that kind of thing. Obviously, India's big part is going to be that spice trade. So the western part of the Silk Road is not as physically as treacherous, but the problem is, is it's not under one continuous rule the way China was. It's not really one continuous rule until you get right there at the coast where the Romans control. The western part's contribution is going to be just as important. They're going to have glassware to sell. They're going to be willing to give up gold and silver in order to get that silk, and they're also going to have seeds. So this last slide is really kind of talking about what gets exchanged. So it's really the Romans and the Chinese, and I keep coming back and forth to this, but about 500 current era, the Romans and the Chinese are high, doing business with each other at a high rate, and all of this completely changes when we look at sociology, when we look at anthropology, we can really start to see evidence that people's diets, what they were growing, completely is changed because of the Silk Road. China gets access to things like citrus fruits, we're talking limes and lemons and grapefruit, grapes from the Mediterranean and Western European grains are also going to make their way into China. The West, uh, the Mediterranean, is also going to gain plants and food stuff. Probably the one, some of the most popular ones that we don't really think of are roses and azaleas. They're such a huge part of even today what we grow in our yards. Apples. We think of apples as such an American food thing, but they actually are a mutation of a Chinese fruit that grows in the steppes. But probably one of the biggest things is the spread of Buddhism. India, where Buddhism starts, Buddhism by the time the Silk Road really gets going is on its way of dying out. Ashoka, um, Emperor Ashoka in India, had kind of adapted Buddhism and it had kind of given it a, a good start, but over time Hinduism was taken back over. But as it spreads and those believers you know, share their ideas along the Silk Road, it becomes very popular. It's also about the time that it really starts to kick in that the Han Dynasty falls apart and this religion gives people a sense of hope, which kind of explains why there's a lot of um, Buddhist temples, the early ones, are built along the Silk Road trade routes. All right, so that's the end, should be the end of the notes that you have. If you would go back through and double check that you've got stuff filled out, tomorrow we will start talking about the process of how to review. If there's something you missed, Go back through in Canvas under Files, there should be a file for China, and the note key should be in there. It's not going to have all this red stuff on there because I just did that. But if you look at the notes section, it should help you out. If you got questions, send me a message. I'll see you guys tomorrow.